it's an albatross here again with the cypher unlimited crew we have our usual suspects of ad or alpha dean we have spigs 18 or anthony and dean what are we doing here tonight well you know i've said this before and i'm gonna say it again you know 2021 is shaping up even though we got all this other crazy going it's shaping up to be a pretty good year in the rpg world and again we have none other than the innovator the inspirer the all-around cool guy that guy we call Monty Cook, you know, because Anthony <laughs> said it himself, the illest pin game in the industry. Oh, my <laughs> God. What we got going on right now, we're here to talk about stealing stories from the devil. The latest Kickstarter, the devil made us do it. Mm. I mean, can, it's just I could go on and on. We could have a whole show of me just ranting about what this guy can do. But hey, <laughs> Monty, welcome back. And I just want to say, you know, to everybody out there, you know, Say hello to Monty Cook. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, uh, good to be back here and uh, happy to be hanging with my Cypher Unlimited pals and uh, talking about some uh, some devil stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're super excited too, Monty. First off, welcome back. You know, welcome back to the CU. But, you know, we're going to just jump right into it. You know, and what everybody's so excited about. The Devil Made Us Do a Kickstarter doing phenomenally well so far. You know, it's already hit 10 stretch grow or stretch goals and growing. Can you speak to us about the main game, Stealing Stories from the Devil? Could you tell us about the concept and, and what's the setting for in this game? Sure. So setting, the setting's easy. The setting is just today, regular world, the world that we understand. The weird part comes in with the player characters. Player characters actually come from the far, far future. And they've got the ability to alter reality in small ways that they, and they call it lying, right? They're lying to reality. So, you know, if they would really like there to be a door into the next room when they go around the corner, they can make that happen, right? If they really want, you know, that guard to fall asleep, you know, because, man, he just was out too late last night. Uh, they can make that happen. Um, the problem is uh, there's something really weird going on. Um, and uh, it seems like reality is falling apart. And uh, that's kind of why the the characters, the liars, are, are back here. They've arrived by accident. Nobody knows how they got back here in the 21st century, but it's a good thing that they're here because something weird's going on and uh, and they can use their powers to, to maybe help things out. It's, it's really a game, you know, I mean, I'm a huge fan of heist movies and shows and books, like, you know, where the characters are all super cool and slick and, you know, can do, you know, James Bond kind of level of amazing things, you know, just like all the time. That's that's kind of what I wanted for this game. Um, and then I wanted to take it a little step further because, you know, uh, I, I like I like weird stuff. And uh, and so, you know, give them give them some special supernatural kind of abilities, um, you know, give an explanation for why that is and and just let them go. Right. And, you know, I wanted to have a game where. The players. <sighs> Uh, you know, had a lot of uh, input um, and, you know, a lot of games are, are uh, going that direction. And uh, I'm, I've always been really interested in that. I mean, you know, uh, even with like the most recent version of Numenera, we did the player intrusions, right? And, and so it kind of started us moving down that way of where the players could have, you know, a little bit of say. And I thought, you know, well, wouldn't it be cool if, if not only that, but if the characters had a little something to say about the setting and whatnot, right? So let's give them the ability to, to make up stuff in reality and have it be true too. Awesome. Yeah, it that works, is, it is well. It's definitely a super interesting concept. And um, now that we're talking a little bit more about the characters and whatnot, so st stealing stories for the devil is being described as like a fast fate, a fast paced tabletop role playing game in which you save existence as we know it by bending reality to carry out the perfect heist. You kind of touched on this a little bit. Can you talk about a little more specifically about how you guys incorporate the lying mechanics within a heist RPG and what are the different types of liars you get to play as in this game? Sure. So there's three different kinds. Um, 
There's, uh, let me see, I've got to make sure I get this right. Uh, there's uh, planners and planners lie to physical reality. So uh, they're the ones that can, you know, oh boy, I really need a screwdriver to, you know, get through this thing. And they open up, open up a drawer and, oh, there's a screwdriver in there, right? How lucky. Um, there are plotters and plotters lie to time. So they're the ones that can say, you know, oh, you know, there was such a big party here last night and everyone got totally wasted and they forgot to lock the doors, you know, <laughs> or they forgot to turn on the alarms or whatever. And they can make that happen. And, you know, lo and behold, there's no alarms turned on. Uh, uh, and then there are uh, schemers and schemers lie to people. Right. And so schemers are the ones who like, you know, tell you, oh, you know, it's much more interesting to look over that way, um, you know, while my friends go by here and, and slip past you and and then they do it. And the mechanic is, uh, and this is this is the part that like some people have had like a little bit of trouble like kind of wrapping their brain around is lying just always works, right? Um, the, the thing about it is, is that there are various sorts of rules and limitations on what you can lie about. But once you decide on a lie, it works. Where the variability and the risk comes in is lies cause a lot of stress uh, on, on, on you uh, being this person who's like screwing around with reality. So uh, the, the bigger the lie, basically, the, the more danger it is to you, the more you're risking um, yourself. Um, you know, you could, you could lay yourself out uh, if you told a, the wrong lie. I mean, I love, I just love that whole concept. I love the idea of success and failure being almost irrelevant. It's the consequence that, right. It, it's the fun <laughs> part. You know, the consequence <laughs> of the success. In, in, in pretty much every role playing game, you don't necessarily remember your greatest successes or your greatest failures. You remember what happened afterwards. Right. You know, like, that's why, true. That's a good know, point. And I and I think that really plays on that. And you know, I think when we played the play test, that was the most enjoyable thing for me. And something cool. else that's really cool is the juxtaposition between the GM and the players. You know, there, there's a massive juxtaposition, which is so cool because you realize as the player, you're feeding the GM. You're like, you know what I'm saying? So literally you are kind of in control of your own destiny or, or the consequences. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Well, one thing that we ought to talk about, um, if you don't mind, is uh, the way, so, you know, like I said, I love heist movies, you know, Ocean's Eleven and all these kinds of things, right? And, uh, you know, one of the things that that is true is, right, like the 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 heist, the people doing the heist, the squad, they, they put together their plan and, and they, you know, they've got all the information that they need. And then they, you know, they do exactly what, what they need to do with it. And how, but how do you do that in a role-playing game? Right. Because, you know, you, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I have run sessions where, you know, I wanted there to be kind of a big heist or whatever. And you just kind of tell people, okay, this is sort of what the layout's like. And people just go, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that brain lock <laughs> right right because you know because we're not professional criminals right at least not most exactly. of them no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the way that this works in stealing stories um which is actually my my very favorite part of the whole game is uh the whole thing starts out you know just like you've seen in every high story where there's like a like a briefing where you get like okay here's the thing you're after and you know you're all standing around uh you know the the blueprints and the maps and the readouts with all the information and everything but the players contribute to what the information that they are seeing right exactly. so you can look down at your character sheet and you can say you know uh my guy's really good at uh you know, talking their way past people and I can, I can sweet talk anybody into anything. So, 
you know, uh, I, you know, you can, and then you just kind of role play it out. I see here in the blueprints, or I, I see here in the information that we have that there's a receptionist here at the front. Um, I'm going to go and, you know, talk to them and, and, you know, get that, get, get them to give us passes or whatever, you know, that we need to, whatever it is, we need to get into this place. And somebody else can say, oh, well, you know, my guy's really good at, at climbing, right? And so uh, I see here there's like this uh, air duct and, you know, uh, it goes through the whole building, goes right up into the secure area. I'm going to crawl up this air duct, right? And so there's, there's this whole thing where like you're helping create the scenario by tailoring it to what you're good at, which is in, in effect, in the end, is the same thing that we see in heist movies and stuff because, like, they're good at the things they need to be good at. Well, so are you because you're deciding what you're going to do, right? <laughs> nice. But the whole thing is like a, a, a negotiation between the players and the GM because every time the players say something, like, you know, oh, uh, there's this receptionist and I'm going to go sweet talk that person, you know, then the... GM gets to give a response, right? And can get, you know, make it a little bit more complicated. Oh, you know, that's true. There, there is this receptionist there, but man, their boss is a real hard ass. And he's always kind of hanging around the front desk and watching what happens and micromanaging. And, you know, you, you, you go back and forth, right? Um, or, you know, oh yeah, there is, there are all these air ducts and everything that you're going to use, but, uh, they put these motion sensitive alarms in the air ducts. And so, you know, you're going to have to deal with that if you're going to use those. And, you know, it, it's a back and forth and it's so much fun. It's my favorite part of the game. Uh, it's almost like the improv exercise. Yes. And like, you know, everyone keeps on building upon, you know, like this extra layer onto the narrative. And we kind of talked about that with Charles and we asked Charles this, this is a part of our questions, but I'll ask you from a design perspective, right? Did you have to view this differently and when you were dis actually describing the game for someone that isn't comfortable or a, a GM that isn't as comfortable allowing, you know, the players to have agency like that? Yes. Um, so you can imagine this game's got a pretty uh, healthy uh, GM section where, uh, and we, we've approached that in two ways, right? Where, um you know, we give a lot of advice and guidelines, you know, and, and basically, you know, my take on it is uh, if this is easier to GM than a regular game, because the players are doing most of the work, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, you know, making a lot of the stuff up and you're just kind of sitting back and saying, okay, right. Um, but the other part of it is this game's going to come with so much, uh, in, uh, information reference that that you that you need right because i've been running this game now for quite a while and so i know the kinds of things that are going to come up right like somebody's going to try to climb up an elevator shaft sometime <laughs> in your game i guarantee it right and so uh this game is going to come with like a schematic of what an elevator shaft looks like and and you know uh, uh whatever and so you can just and it'll these will be uh, i think the way we're envisioning is that they'll be loose sheets in the box so you just pull the ones that you need and so you just be like okay well I, I, i'll just pull out that elevator shaft thing and you know uh you know oh and this whole thing is going to be taking place in a museum oh i've got a museum map already here for like all the stuff will be there for you even though um you know it's even though the it's not pre-scripted the way like you know when you're running an adventure uh, uh is uh, you know, in a, like a conventional game, the stuff that you need will still be there, right? Um, and, you know, if you have to make a few things up, no one's going to know, right? That's, that's, that's actually the real secret to improv gaming, right? Is just say it and, yeah. and everyone's going to go with it, right? <laughs> hey, I, I've been doing that for 25 years. And it exactly, works. right? Yeah. yeah bro. <laughs> that definitely does sound like a lot of fun and a little bit of, uh, I guess, ease of mind for newer GMs because you have these mini GMs, basically. They're they're adding on to the story for you, with you. And yeah, that, that's definitely a great point for people who might be a little nervous about improving basically a full session. But you know, it's not just you. It's you and your whole table. Exactly. Right. It, In a way, I think it's if if we do our job right, we can convince people that like, 
this is less intimidating than running a game because when you're when you're running, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like a more standard game. Because when you're running, you know, you're playing Cipher System, you're playing D and D, whatever game you're playing, like you've got to sort of be on top of everything, and you've got to know all the facts about you know where Elminster lives and all that stuff. And uh, here you're you're doing it all together, right? It's it's more like you're sitting down with your friends and making up something. Yeah. Now, before I ask you the next question, I do have to say that, you know, you brought up a great point. And I think for more experienced GMs and people who are like stuck in the, I guess you would say the more systemology idea ideas, this would probably be a great game to help them break through that wall, break through that, you know, that, that uh, proverbial fourth wall. Because, you know, I think that's where the, what the big thing happens. So it's, right. it's really cool. I'm glad you. I'm glad you guys are making this game. This is awesome. So, you know, let me let me throw in one more thing too. One other thing that we're we're doing to help GMs, and that is unlike any other game I've done, um, the the format that uh, the way a game session is presented is is actually kind of rigid, um, and that is meant to be like these bare bones that you can that will help you build your build the mission around right so we divide everything up into acts three acts and and specific thing specific kinds of things always happen in a given act and so you know okay we're in act two at some point that's when i'm gonna play the turn card and the turn card means you know something really weird happens and that, that they weren't expecting or you know oh it's it's the third act and so things are gonna you know things gotta wrap up fast and you gotta have a big climactic finish um and and even on top of that the game rules right there in the rules actually mandate that you take a break at your game table between acts um, not just so that everyone can go get snacks and, and whatnot um but that just gives the gm like four or five minutes to just make sure they've got their mind wrapped around everything and are ready to go for the rest of the game. Yeah, that's great. It, has a, it does work. It, it really does. It's good stuff. So my question is basically, you know, this is a complete game in a box. You know, now it requires, you know, as, as you've told us, no prep, you know, we say little to no prep, but can you let our audience know exactly what comes in the box and does your design process change anything when designing a complete role-playing game in one package? Um, well, so let me answer the last question first, which is, um, I, I think it does change your design process, but I got to tell you, it is, it is my preferred way of doing things. Um, like if, if you, if you design like, I mean, this comes up in video games too, right? Where people complain that they, they, they don't design the whole game and then you got to buy the, the DLC and all that stuff. And right. And like, you know, it's the same was true of, of, you know, other game systems that I've worked on where, um, you know, you, you put out some core books, but then you've pretty much got to have the next couple of supplements to really even make the game go in, in the way you want it to. And, I'm not a fan. Um, uh, uh, you know, if all you want to do is is play this game, you should just be able to buy the game and and you got everything. If you want more, we'll give you more. But you know, you want to, you know, you want a Numenera bestiary, great. But you don't have to have it. There's a bunch of creatures in Numenera, right? Um, but this, so the inside the box, what you get are three books. First one's called Liars, and it's all about uh, making characters and the basic rules of the game. Um, the second book is called The Devil, and it is all about um, uh, running the game and uh, advice for the GM. And it also has uh, 12 missions, basically, that play out as... Uh, I, I call it like a season, so it's because it's kind of like a television season. And uh, these will, you know, again, it's it's so much of the game needs to rely on the player input that there I, I don't I hesitate to call this like a a pre-written campaign or set of adventures, but it's a it's it's a guideline for the GM so that you know, okay, so your first mission is 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 this, 
you know, basically, right? And the second mission, this happens. And uh, this has allowed me to like give some suggestions for some really weird stuff that might happen. Like, like you know, we've talked about what the, sort of the core thing is at the beginning of the game, but there are things that are implied that could happen in this game. Um, you know, like, like your characters are from the far future. So clearly time travel is possible. Is it possible that there might be missions where you actually have to travel through time? Is there, for example, a point in the first season there where you end up going to the Old West and have to hold up a train? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, it, so, you know, there's all kinds of that kind of thing. And, and it also, you know, sort of alluding to the fact that there is this figure called the devil that is somehow involved. And um, this season also kind of explained, and the, and the book, The Devil, kind of explains you know, why it is that on your second mission, there's somebody else just kind of, there's this guy and he shows up and you don't know who he is, but everyone else seems to know who he is and treat him with all this respect. And, and who is this guy and why, you know, what, what, what's his, what's his whole deal? Um, he uh, uh, will, will be an interesting figure uh, in, in a, in a campaign or in this season, if, if you want to run through it, um, I don't want to go too heavy into spoilers. Uh, and then lastly, there is, uh, a, a smaller book called the stories they steal. And, uh, it has a bunch of just real world research that I've done over the last year or so on this kind of thing. Like, so I will just you know, you can read this book and you will know all about alarm systems and security systems and security guard procedures. And, you know, if you call the fire department, how long does it take them to show up? And, you know, all those kinds of things that you're, you're just going to want to know because they're going to come up, right? And it'll be a really easy thing to reference, you know, you just look it up real quick. Um, and then, and then, uh, all those handouts that I talked about uh, where, you know, just maps and diagrams and interesting things that you're going to want to just kind of pull out. Um, and we keep on the thanks to the Kickstarter, we keep unlocking more. And so there's going to be a bunch of these things in there. And, you know, Bear uh, White, our art director and I were just talking about, you know, what, what they're all going to be and, um, you know, how we're going to get these made. And we're, we're talking to, you know, some actual uh, architect, kind of cartographers as opposed to sort of the regular rpg cartographers that we often get um to you know just make them look like real blueprints and and whatnot right so so there you'll have that immersion i'm really excited for the handouts i think um i love like same thing with you know invisible sun the handouts not i love invisible sun but i could use the handouts of so many different other rpgs you know it's like the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> Not only people play for this game. game. Yeah, you can use them for pretty much any game on your shelf. I yeah. have. A, I bought. A, I bought two extra sooth decks just for that reason because I use the sooth deck in my one fantasy game. It controls like, you know, the magic in the world and how because the world the magic is based on the four elements, and so based the sooth deck controls the magic. So yeah, you're right. And then this sounds just like something that's gonna you know impact my you know, claim the sky campaign. Absolutely, <laughs> right? <laughs> Before I ask my next question, you mentioned something about um, getting weird. I'm just going to personally say this. I would be disappointed if I purchased any Monty Cook Games, <laughs> you know, project and we weren't getting a little bit weird, you know? That's like Kool-Aid <laughs> without sugar. Monty, you need a little weirdness in your Monty Cook Games. <laughs> Monty, I just want you, I, I'm going give to give you a suggestion. You need a title, we, you need to do the next game and just call it The Mind of Monty. <laughs> <laughs> we already did book M. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, um, from our experience with the playtest, we really learned a lot, you know, which was awesome, by the way. Sean did a great job as a, a GM. We had a phenomenal time. But, you know, the game, you touched on this a little bit 
in one, in one of the other questions, but the game really feels like player agency is in the forefront. It really gives you a true group collaborative experience, allowing the GM to really incorporate the players, you know, into the narrative. Was this your intention to do? And do you provide the GM and players advice and tools on how to, you know, utilize this game play style? For sure. Um, there's a, I think that mostly the GM is the one who, cause it's, I think the GM is the one who uh, this game is going to be the most different experience for um, because basically you're kind of, you're giving over some things that are normally your responsibility to the players um, in order to, for the players to be sort of more competent in the story. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of advice on that, but there is advice for the players, not only just on that, but just on like, uh, again, like how I was saying, I did all this research on uh, for the GM side, there's a whole section in the liars book about, you know, here's a bunch of cons that people can run, right? Here's a bunch of tactics and tricks and, you know, plans. Uh, this is how you break into a building, right? I'm sure I'm on some kind of FBI watch list at this point for all the research that I've done and all the Google searches that I have done. But I, I also think it probably wouldn't be the first time because um, a long time ago I wrote a, this whole conspiracy book and I'm sure I'm on some watch list somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this Monty Cook? It's <laughs> Monty Cook. I don't know who this is. <laughs> oh, boy. He's right. right and left wing conspiracies. This guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he just believes everything. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... <laughs> you already you already kind of touched on this this uh, question a little bit earlier, but we didn't get too um, too in depth with it. But could you tell us a little bit more about the main conflict resolution mechanic and what dice do you need to roll for this game? Uh, so we use all the kind uh, you know all the standard polyhedrals in this game, um, and the reason for that is basically um, if you're just average at something. Um, much like in the Cypher system, the GM is going to set like a, a difficulty, uh, although it's even it's even more straightforward in this game. Basically, you're just kind of saying, is it easy, average, hard, very hard? Um, and uh, each one of those uh, comes with a with a uh, some num with numbers. Right. Um, and so. Uh, you if you're just average at something, you're going to roll a D6 um, if you're good at that kind of thing, you're going to roll a D8. If you're really, really good, you're going to roll a D10, right? And so uh, because of the way that, that that progression works, if the number that you're looking for is a six, well, if you're average at it, it's going to be hard, right? But if you're good at it, it's going to be easier. And if you're really good at it, you got almost a 50-50 shot, right? And so it's, uh, it, 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 expands in that interesting way and then if you've got again what you know talking to the cypher unlimited guys here <laughs> like in the cypher system if you have like an asset uh or you know if you have something that helps you or another character is helping you then you get to roll two of the whatever dice uh, you've got it set at uh that you're using but you, and you take the best one of the two um and then uh basically that's the way that's the way you handle everything um and so like if 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 like there's you know i don't know some uh lock and uh your character is trying it's but it's just an average lock and your character's trying to pick it but they're they're good at lock picking you know you're gonna be rolling a d8 and if your friend is also helping you out you might be rolling 2d8 and you and you see basically uh you 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 can get have a success or a failure, but we've also got this range in the middle called almost, where uh, you um, can, uh, you know, you, you you get some kind of partial success, but it's not exactly what you wanted. Um, there's also, again, really really doubling down on the idea that that the characters are really competent they're really good at what they do every player also has mission cards that they can play over the course of a mission you'll get three of them each time although advanced characters can get more 
Um, and like these kinds of things will be like, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really good at this, right? And you play that card and now you can re-roll a failure uh, one time, right? Um, and, and you're using a larger die type, right? But there's also some funky ones, right? Where you're like, I've done this before and you play that card and then you have to explain a situation from your character's past uh, that, you know, you're just making up there, right? That, oh, you know, this is just like that time that uh, my friends and I had to, you know, sneak into that bank vault and blah, 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 right? And you kind of explain the whole story, you know, quickly, right? And then, the, you know, the GM says, yeah, that is just like this situation. And you get, you know, to roll a higher die type or, or whatever the thing is. Um, and so there's a lot of things like that uh, built into the game um, that just allow players to just uh you know be really good at what they're doing and but that doesn't mean that like the game is really easy because it, what all that does is it gives the gm the freedom to make things really hard right and to throw those twists and turns in there that you know they really weren't expecting and you know um uh you know like i was playing i was running a game just not very long ago and the i think the player characters were you're trying to get into this like ceo's office and so they were they had set up this whole thing where they were trying to frame her uh into uh you know some kind of crime and then but the turn was that she really was involved in the crime and the cops and the fbi showed up right then and made things way harder because they were like watching everything and um you know that that, that kind of thing it is really fun uh, as the GM. You can just, it, it's like, it's like a big massive GM intrusion right into the middle of the things, right? The, the cool kind of, part of, it's like a built-in flashback. <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. Like the built-in flashback scene in the movie, you know? Exactly, when, yeah. When the guys get ready to pick the lock and then the screen fades, and you see this whole <laughs> thing happen, and then when it fades back in, the lock goes click. <laughs> Dean, Dean, before you ask your question, just talking to Monty Hannum talk made me just think of an entirely different question. And while we're still on this game, I want to ask it. You mentioned you when you were talking, you mentioned advanced character. Um, there was some confusion on the server of whether this is a one-shot game, even though we were told otherwise that it can be um played in campaigns. So is there like a sort of character advancement for your there character? Absolutely there absolutely is, right? Because the game is called Stealing Stories, and so, so you're going into these places, and and you're you're. We didn't really talk about this yet, but like, so you're going into these places where reality is starting to get wonky, right? The the vertical hold starting to get a little weird, and reality there, and it's because there are these objects, these key objects that you then you have to get hold of and then remove from the zone of improbability, which is what's the, the weird area, right? And when you do that, um, you actually erase all of everything that just happened. Um, it, you know, you, you, you rewrite reality so that the weird, you know, because maybe, maybe it was raining frogs or, or something weird was going on in there, right? You make it so that that never happened. You were never there. And uh, the only people that remember the story that you take away are you, uh, your, your little group, right? Um, and, and so you've stolen that story. And based on the story, literally based on like the cards that get played during the case course of the game, that's kind of the XP that you get. Um, and you take that story and uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's like stories kind of have power kind of idea, right? And so you, you the more, the better the story that you take away, um, the more, XP, we don't call them XP, but, but basically the more your character can advance and improve your skills, maybe improve the way you can lie, you know, take away some of the limitations on your lies, um, you know, maybe you can get special powers, uh, because, you know, there are, you are from the super far future. And so, uh, you know, maybe you get some kind of cool new cybernetic thing that helps you in your next mission or whatever, you know, oh, so you hey, everybody pay down. attention. Yeah, uh, oh, there's still everybody pay. See, you got to pay attention to these things. You know, just like we don't hoard XP, you don't hoard your cards, play them, <laughs> get them out there. 
Monty is really sneaky about incentivizing you. Good, good. good. Yeah. Play the game, right? That's right. That's right. Well, you, you absolutely could play a campaign. I could, I could even just picture running a couple of sessions on the ship alone. Yeah, like, right. I, right, exactly. Yeah, that's what I, when I was talking about the, the, the season of missions, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what I'm calling the uh, a campaign, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not presented like a campaign because, again, you know, there's so much player input and whatnot um, in, the, in the stories, um, but, uh, but the framework is all there, right? And, um, you know, some weird stuff can happen. Uh, I see this being perfect for game night. Everybody wants to do game night and us role players, you know, nothing to get wrong with a board game. Everybody loves a good board game, but this, oh my God. Yeah, this works. <laughs> so we're talking about stealing stories, you know, for the devil. Now, not only does that come in the box, but the Kickstarter has also opened up two additional games uh, from the stretch goals. Can you tell us a little bit about who the devil you are and what makes it different from stealing stories from the devil? For the devil. So, um, so uh, who, who the devil are you? Um, is is actually, um, you know, if you look at it from like an evolutionary point of view, it's actually the game that came first. Um, it uses the exact same character mechanics that you know all the the stuff we were talking about with the dice and and all of that stuff works exactly the same. Um, but but it doesn't have any of the lying aspect to it. Instead, like like if you want a game where you can just sit down with a bunch of people like at a convention or or you know game night or you know uh, spur of the moment gaming, that's what that's what uh, who the devil are you is all about because basically the GM like, paints paints a picture maybe maybe literally shows a, a, a picture or maybe uh you know describes an image and then they say and and the game tonight is going to be about this genre right and so like like i might say uh, okay so you're 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 all standing on what looks like the bridge of a starship and you can see through the view screen that you're coming upon uh, a, a satellite and uh, it's in orbit uh, or like a space station and it's in orbit around uh, a huge planet and you're, you're just coming in for the approach uh, and there seems to be some kind of warning signal uh, going off on, the, uh, on, the, on your, on your uh, Starship readout and uh, it's obviously a science fiction game. And then I and I say, then I say, who the devil are you? And the players then have to figure out, okay, so you know, we're the bridge crew of this starship, and we're coming in, we're we're delivering a load of supplies to this uh the space station, you know, and I and then I would probably then say, well, then what's that warning light mean? <laughs> and you know the players would have to say oh uh there's you know we're being chased by pirates or whatever right and uh so the the players provide like all the meat and uh you know all the gm has to do is then just kind of you know give everything okay well the pirates are probably mostly average but the pirate captain is is very hard and you know just just kind of go with things right and then the players make up characters um based on this because again character generation is really fast in this game you just basically pick a couple of things that you're good at one thing that you're not good at and and you know you, you go and uh and that's really fun. And, and so this game uh, w will be uh, uh, most of this game will be just sort of like, you know, as the GM, how do you, how do you present this? How do you handle it? How do you deal with the fact that you just have no idea what the players are going to come up with? Right. And, and, and how do you react? And, and then it's going to come with a bunch of set, um, uh, sort of opening scenes right so like like the one that i just said might be one um i've played uh, I've, we've play tested this game a lot um for the this last is, couple of years this, and this is like the perfect party game 
Oh, it absolutely, absolutely is right. Because I guarantee you, it's just things are like you know how we talk about games going off the rails. This game doesn't have any rails. <laughs> <laughs> no, like like one of my favorite examples was I started off with a scene. It was like it was going to be a fantasy adventure, and I started off with a scene, and it was clearly very like egyptian there's these big pyramids and there's it's nighttime and there's and there's you know looks like there's like all these servants like carrying something into the pyramid and i thought you know i figured all the player characters will probably be like adventurers and they want to get the treasure from the tomb or whatever right but the player characters decided that they were all gods and that they were coming because they were coming here because there was another god who lived in the pyramid and they needed to talk to him about something right and it just it was so great because it totally threw me for a loop and it kept me on my toes and uh you know it's just it's really fun um it's it's just loose and fast and fun and funny and it's definitely a one-shot there is no there is no advancement or or session two of this it's just kind of see what craziness everyone can come up with as a group. I think nice. we all for the crazy. This is... <laughs> and this also sounds like a great gateway game to get someone into role-playing games. Yeah, it, absolutely. It absolutely would be. I totally agree, right? Because it really just, you know, the, the rules are very light and, you know, it, it, it shows you that, you know, I'm deciding who I am and and what I'm doing here, right? That was actually the original name of the game was Who Are You and Why Are You Here? Um, I changed it. (laughs) Yeah, this is kind of funny because it's like, you know, like I said, when you say can go off the rails, I mean, how Sean, how when we played with Sean, it was like a booze crew. So we were frat, we were infiltrating a frat party and it got totally out there. (laughs) Luckily, we finished the mission. You also have a complete third game, you know, as well. The Devil's Dandy Dogs. Can you tell us a little something about this game? And did you guys always plan to have three complete games for this? For the um, one, which is awesome? We, you know, I mean, that's why we didn't name the Kickstarter Stealing Stories for the Devil. Because we actually, we really wanted to kickstart these three games. Um, but, you know... We we also knew that like you know three separate games is is more time it's more money it's more you know everything so we had to reach certain levels of the Kickstarter and thankfully this one has, um, but uh, so Devil's Dandy Dogs is written by uh, Shauna Germain and uh, she's been talking about this uh, quite a while and basically. Uh, so there, you know, there's kind of out of folk tale, folklore kind of idea that that the devil has these sort of mysterious shadowy black dogs that kind of do his bidding. And so in this game, you are a pack of these dogs and the mm-hmm. devil is sending you off on some mission and you have to perform it. And uh, so the, the game has, th- this game is even simpler uh than than the other games right you have three stats you have um devil which is how good you are at supernatural things dandy which is how like good you are at like smart and interaction and uh uh, you know and and intelligence things and then dogs which is how good you are at at being a dog right and like physical (laughs) stuff right you know if you could just have to go bite somebody you'd use your dog stat right um and uh you um and then every the really cool thing is, is that it's very heavily based on these cards. You play out these, uh, the GM plays out these cards that kind of determine what the mission is, but then the players have cards um, that they can use that give them abilities. But at, the more cards they play, the more they might, every dog has a temptation mm-hmm. and you might trigger your temptation, right? And so you're, temp- and, and you're, te- you know, the thing that tempts you, you know, I mean, sort of the, silliest example but you know it's it's sort of the dog example right it might be food right and so you know if you if you give in to your temptation you know by rolling the wrong you know number on the die or whatever uh you uh you know have to then fulfill that 
that need, right? And it might just be food. Um, and uh, and so you e each dog is is got a different sort of set of abilities and a different temptation. And the more you use your abilities, the greater the chances that you're eventually, you know, it's it's like your it's like your temptation is what fuels you. Um, and so the more you use it, the more eventually you have to give into it. Does and, it use the same dice mechanics or is it a different? No, set? it's got uh, it's got a slightly different uh, mechanic system, which uh, Shauna is is like, I think, literally in the next room working on as we speak. Um, go, she, Shana, go. <laughs> yeah. I, I, she just said something, but I don't I didn't hear it. <laughs> She just yelled out 3D6s. Oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I don't know we're getting this <laughs> comment. Uh, actually, 3D6s is the perfect dice mechanic. It is. It is. In fact, something <laughs> special happens if you roll 3D6s uh, in this game. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah. That's that's so cool. <laughs> I'm super excited. And again, it was just so funny how we have like the writer commenting off screen like this. Like, <laughs> oh Perfect. man! But, but uh, yeah, with only about 45 hours left on this Kickstarter, do you guys have any more surprises in store for us? Uh, and is there anything you would like the audience to know about this Kickstarter? Um. You know, uh, we we have a few more stretch goals in mind if 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 things keep moving along, um, and uh, I know that uh, uh, for example, um, we want it with there might be something for Devil's Dandy Dogs that you know makes it a lot nicer when you are. Uh, you, there's a very specific way in which the game master lays out the cards. So if a certain, it's kind of like the tarot deck, right? If certain card is in a certain position, it has a certain meaning and, you know, there might be some cool ways that we can, uh, through stretch goals, provide you something that makes that a lot nicer and easier to do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got a few other ideas. Um, uh if you're if you're if you're wondering if there's a fourth game there is not no <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> three, is, three is the magic number but, but we're not done right we, we you we can be pushed into into some even even more stuff so nice nice, nice. uh it was worth a shot it was worth a shot <laughs> don't blame me blame the devil <laughs> Well, you know, you guys you realize that number you do guys realize that number three that's the radical of six six six. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, don't get me started with the numerology. Okay, we're, we're, I'm bad. I'm bad. Okay. No. So, any new projects or anything you can tell us about? You know, or can you tell us some stuff about the previous Kickstarters? You know, like again, you know, my thing, claim the sky. Come on, talk about it. Uh, or. <laughs> Any and how's the work coming along on Atollis Adventures? So um, two, uh, there's so there's three advent three uh, Tolis Adventures in the in the city. They're going to be collected in the City of Adventures book, but they'll all be individual PDFs if you want them that way too. And uh, I would say that like two, there are two and a half of them are written, um, and uh, the first one. Uh, we're already, we've already gotten the art in, I think. Um, so it's, it's close. Um, it's, it's pretty close to coming out. And so they'll come out, like I said, as individual PDFs, and then we're going to combine them into a book. Uh, and, and they're really cool. A um, lot of chaos, cultist craziness. And uh, there's some stuff with, uh, you know, ghoul, the, 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 uh, you know the entity who lives halfway up the spire and uh yeah there's there's some cool stuff nice i'm excited and, for those adventures especially and, i'm excited for claim the sky as well but yeah that's what i'm saying anything yeah. on claim the sky you want to tell me anything else i mean uh claim the sky is also uh we're getting really close uh, i think the last few pieces of art are coming in um and we've got some cool cool art where uh we basically had uh, you know, because we've got uh, the the setting um, and you know characters in the setting uh, that you can that you can use, and so we've got a couple of different full page 
comic pages, right? With multi panels where we're, you know, get to actually kind of tell a little bit of a story. Uh, like, like, you know, you're, you're looking at a comic from the boundless setting. Um, but, uh, I think you guys have seen, um, uh, uh, basically the, the rough draft, um, and it's in editing. Now. I, I think actually it might actually be done in editing. So it's, it's, it's going along really well and, uh, uh, right on track. Okay. Well, Monty, once Flame of Sky comes out, can I have you, Shauna, Bruce, and Sean on and run you guys into one shot, a, a Flame of Sky one shot? Oh, that'd be fun. That'd be really fun. All right. You heard it here, guys. Monty's going to play Claim the Sky with me. <laughs> you know how, how you open the one game and then invite us. Yeah, it just completely <laughs> ignores ancient and space. Oh, no, you guys just, know you're always invited. <laughs> just completely, <laughs> just, just ditching us immediately. He's already never, trying to get in never, with the never, MCG never. crew. <laughs> never, never, never. You guys know you're my brother. Before, before Al opens up, you know, um, for the audience to ask the questions, I have just one last question. I know I'm a pain, but are we ever going to see a cipher system bestiary? Um, uh, we still want to make one. Uh, so, um, and you know, we've got some ideas for more cipher system, um, like, like genre and setting books, uh, that we would like to work on, uh, you know, like, uh, there's a couple of us here who really, really love post-apocalypse. Um, and, uh, you know, I know there's a, there's been a lot of interest in like cyberpunk and that kind of thing too. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, you know, if we did something like that, um, you know, I would love to put a, a cyber, you know, put a cyber system bestiary in there too, in, in with the mix of products and, and that would be great because there's a lot of things that I would love to see us put in there, right? I mean, the creatures in the uh, Cyber System rulebook are, are good, but there's so much more to do. <laughs> you, uh, see, there you go, Monty. That's your next Kickstarter. Just, you know, a set of three genre books, you know, post-apocalyptic, punks, you know, we got it. Um, Charles did say that post-apocalyptic is his favorite setting, and he's... I know. That's going to get done. <laughs> you only um, tell me that about once a day, so... <laughs> Before we jump into the uh, the questions from the audience, just real quick, uh, Ken, uh, buddy, Ken Davidson in chat said, you got you got to do cyberpunk, uh, call it cypherpunk. Uh, he <laughs> it says Verge is dope and all, but he wants the tools. Oh, right. but yeah, you definitely definitely have people clamoring for more settings. So, <laughs> and also um, speaking, of, oh wait, a minute, real quick too, before we go yeah. into our questions, also from Ken, he wanted to let you know that his son absolutely loves No Thank You Evil. Awesome. <laughs> that when he when he first came in, so. Yes, yes, yes. Love All it. right, so let's dive into these audience questions. So I'm just gonna go into order that we received them in the chat, as you know the you know our little interview has been going so our first one actually is from ken also um he asks are you guys going to be releasing more seasons for stealing stories for the devil um so it's it's quite possible um i think it you know it's those kinds of things are always sort of based on demand right like like if there's a lot of people out there who are playing stealing stories and want more, um, you know, we'll we'll that's that's what capitalism's all about, right? <laughs> if you want it, we'll make it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but, but you know, it, it, we don't have that. Uh, I, I can't say with certainty that we have that decided now, right? We kind of have to see how. The, I mean, the, the Kickstarter is doing really well, which is a really great. Uh, uh, push in that direction of more stealing stories material. If you know anything about the um, MCG fans, if you tell them to ask for it, they will ask for it. <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we love them, right? And, and you know, I mean, it's also worked, right? One of the reasons that we did Claim the Sky is because, well, you guys, but also a lot of other people, you know, said superheroes, superheroes, right? So. Thanks. It works. Um, yeah. 
um our next couple of questions are from uh samuel k kaufman he has two questions uh first question is uh you kind of touched on this a little bit with our you know what's to come but he's asking uh what stretch goals do you think that might make it to the end of this current kickstarter that hasn't been revealed yet? i guess he's just trying to fish for some information <laughs> on what might be there just like we have been fishing uh but yeah, yeah that, that's the first the, question i think i already gave the hints that i'm gonna give um <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't hurt to ask it again just because it was an audience question. But either way, the second question here would be, um, would you be for or against a computer RPG or like a computer game set in the tallest universe developed by someone outside of Montica Games? Why or why not? Well, um, uh, sure, right? <laughs> uh, if it's the right, if it's the right developer, right? I mean, we we did the the. You know, we, we we contracted out with an exile, and they made the the tides of Numenera. Yeah, and right. uh, uh, we're we're open to that kind of collaboration. I mean, we're not we're not computer game designers, um, but obviously, you know, they would uh, they would have to they'd have to work with us, right? Um, I mean, one of the things that was really fun about the tides of Numenera game was that you know I got to be involved and you know kind of give thumbs up thumbs down and it was almost basically it was always thumbs up because they really <laughs> got numenera and they really understood it and had a bunch of really cool ideas but right nice. a good friend brilliant loser asked what's your favorite foci Ooh. um wow you know I always, I always hesitate when people ask me favorite questions because even if I give you an answer now, it's going to be different an hour from now. But, <laughs> uh, you know, just for sentimental reasons, I'm going to say uh, Bears a Halo of Fire. <laughs> we you do it. Al's already doing the Halo. <laughs> About a month ago, we did a video and we surveyed everyone through our social media to give us their top five folk eyes, right? And I was telling everyone that Bears a Halo of Fire is going to win, is going to be number one hands down. It wasn't. It was actually third. And I was really shocked. But I thought most people would pick Bears a Halo of Fire. For me, because that's the very first folk I, that I created, yeah, right? The first one that I wrote, uh, and um, uh, yeah. What was so? What was first? Number uh, was uh, rides the lightning. Oh yeah, that's a good one too. And what, what was the third? The number two was uh, was the um, healing one, right? It was uh, works miracles. Works miracles. Or, works miracles yeah. Wait, I forget right if that was number two, but it was out there. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah, I was, and you know, we surveyed over a hundred people, and um, I was shocked that uh, <laughs> I I swore to Dean up and down that it was going to be Bears Hill. I was like, it's going to be a landslide. It's not even going to be close. <laughs> you know, because I, you know, I've run a lot of MCG con games, and I've run a lot of MCG games, and you know, that's always commonly picked. Yeah, Rise of Lightning was number one. Yeah. Works of Miracles was two, and. Um, Bears a Halo of Fire was three. What was the top? What was four and five again? I don't know. Fuses Flesh with Steel and um, uh, move, uh, Magnetism, Employees Magnetism. Sure. Those were our top five, were the top five. <clears throat> but yeah, and when we looked at them, though, it was kind of funny because a <laughs> lot of those we, I've never played with or anything else. But those folk, all five of those folk are like phenomenal when you really look at them and you look into them. So not um, surprising whatsoever. We did get one more comment that I'm going to turn into a question because I think it's a good question. Uh, Carol Latrosophy, I'm, I'm horrible pronouncing names, sorry, but Carol has, I really hope this, or says, I really hope this collection gets opened up to the Cypher Creator Program because I want to do so much with this framework. So the obvious question is, will these be available or opened up to the Cypher Creator Program at some point? You know, that is <clears throat> literally the first time that anyone has asked me that. And I, I uh, including internally, uh, uh, really? you know, among, among the company, we haven't talked about it at all. Um, it is certainly something that we can talk about. Uh, it's certainly something we'll consider. 
Oh, oh, we started to get more questions coming. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So right, um, we'll do two more before we go to a rapid fire. Um, yeah, but, there's one from Ken and there's one from Disney Single. Gotcha. Do you, you want to do it or you got it? I got. I'll take. Uh, I'll take Sammy. What's your? You said Ken. Yeah, Ken, uh, I'll do Ken and you do this. And this. Ken asked, "Was was there any inspiration from um, Blades in the Dark for this game?" Um. Not, I mean, uh, so I'm familiar with Blades in the Dark and I like it very, very much. Um, <clears throat> and clearly that game is trying to accomplish a lot of the same things that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and it, it does them in a very different way. And I think that that's, that's really cool. Um, but it's in the end, pretty different. Like, uh, well, I mean, even even setting and stuff aside, uh, just just the way that like it empowers sort of the characters to be really good at heists is very different. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where like if you were going to make a movie out of uh, out of each a session of each of these games, they might actually end up being very, very similar. But at the table, I think they're going to feel very different to play. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I played a lot of Blades in the Dark and I've got to play this play test. They both yeah. ice games, but they run entirely different. Entirely game. different, two different yeah. games. But yeah. Yeah. um so real quick, uh Samuel Kaufman just wants to just and I'm quite sure I think I was understanding Monty was pretty clear on it, but he said he wanted to just be clear. He said you wouldn't be against a game set in the Tolis universe. He'd love to make a game set in that universe, but doubt he could do it on his own, sadly. Yo, um, you're supposed to read Destiny's singles question. I know, I was just bringing that up so much to do what the guy was saying. So Destiny's question, he said, can we get some more information on Break the Horizon? His group is nipping at his heel, her, their group is nipping at their heels for more vehicles. Uh, then that, that book's gonna make you really happy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's got, it, not only does it have a bunch of new vehicles, but Bruce did this cool thing where he basically went through every single Numenera product and, and collected all the different kinds of vehicles that have appeared anywhere in a Numenera product. Um, you know, he did that initially, you know, to kind of see what was already out there to make new ones. And then he made a whole bunch of new ones. Uh, and, uh, so that's really cool. Plus there's, um, you know, a bunch of there's like a bunch of great adventures to to throw into your game when you are, uh, you know, your characters are traveling from one place to another, uh, which you know I don't know it happens a lot in my Numenera games. So uh, <laughs> I, I like the idea that um, you know something that you can just kind of throw in before they get to the place they thought they were going, right? Then this weird thing happens, uh, which is the way every Numenera start adventure. <laughs> yes, this weird thing happens. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean, that's, I think that's the bulk of the book. There's, there's also, you know, some new equipment and, and some new, uh, ciphers and artifacts, uh, but everything is dealing with travel. It's all about travel. Uh, but when is that dropping? If, if there's a possible ETA? Oh, I am the worst person <laughs> to ask that kind of question. Um, it's got to be really soon, um, but I. TM. <laughs> I <love laughs> you know, I, I'm, not, I'm really. I'm not trying to be evasive. It's just like that's the kind of stuff I don't keep in my brain. Um, open your, go downstairs and open your mailbox now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it um, must. It, it, it's. I think. Uh, I th I want to say it's like at the printer, but but uh, which would mean you know we're. We're just a few weeks away, but nice. Cool. Okay. Um, real right, quick so, though, um, well, well okay. Anthony, th there was one more question. I think it's a really good question. Um, before we move on to the rapid fire, and I feel like this is a this will be a fairly short answer. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name. It looks like a bunch of letters. PDX, PDX. Yeah, there we go. That person asked, "Would you be open to partnering with someone to create an experience like D and D Beyond for Cipher System?" Um maybe uh it would depend on the the experience and and you know i mean if it was awesome sure i mean i think uh dnd beyond is is really pretty damn awesome uh so I'd, I'd want it to be you know as good as that good answer nice. 
All right. So, All right, Monty, um, you know, this is where we go. We normally do our rapid fire questions, but you've been there, done that, you know. So um, we created a new series of like rapid fire questions that we did with Sean. You know, we mixed it up a little. We added a little travel, a little heist movie, a little, you know, um, time travel culture in our rapid fire questions. So are you ready for these brand new rapid fire questions? Yes, I'm Drum ready. Roll, please. Oh, we need Latia to give us a. She's oh, yeah, the, like, we, yeah, we need that recording. <laughs> so we find out Latia actually knows how to play drums, so she's supposed yes. to send us a recording of drum rolls. <laughs> yes. So many. I, I feel like every week I learn some new thing that she is great at. <laughs> so, right. so let's kick this off. Would yeah. you rather be a con artist or a pickpocket? Con artist. Hmm. Favorite time machine, the DeLorean, DCM-12, complete with flux capacitor from Back to the Future, or the time displacement sphere from Terminator? Oh, I, I got to go with the DeLorean because I want to keep my clothes on. It's <laughs> <laughs> part of the fun. <laughs> I mean... If I just show up somewhere in another <laughs> time, I'm not going to look like Arnold. I promise you. <laughs> Here's another favorite time machine. Favorite time machine. The TARDIS from Doctor Who or the time sled from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine? Oh, I'm going to go with the time sled. And I know that's probably not a popular answer, uh, but... Uh, you and Sean had the same answer. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. In fact, in the the most recent time machine movie wasn't wasn't great but the time machine was awesome yeah it really i just want to travel through time like santa claus it just look <laughs> <laughs> all right more favorite time machines the phone booth from bill and ted's excellent adventure or the hot tub from hot tub time machine oh gotta go with the phone booth from bill and ted uh, <laughs> i love bill and ted <laughs> nice all right so better heist movie the Sting or Ocean's Eleven? You know, uh, that's really hard. I really like both those movies, but I'm going to go with uh, Ocean's Eleven. Would you rather be the driver or the muscle in a heist? Oh, driver, please. <laughs> <laughs> muscle, muscle almost always that they don't come out well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, better better devil in film tim curry in legend or robert de niro in angel heart or al pacino from the devil's advocate oh all good devils um uh wow you know uh, <laughs> this is a tough one <laughs> it is that's the hardest one you've asked so far um i'll go with tim curry but i really like them all yeah. <laughs> Sean went with that with you kind of the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so, what devil child would you rather face? Damien <laughs> from The Omen, Children of the Corn, or Children of the Damned? Uh, well, our age shows, because I always throw in one of those old movies. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, well, which one would I rather face? Yes. Yeah. They're all creepy and free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I'll go with Damien. Um, although, you know, I'm sure I won't end up well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least you have a head start because every time he kills someone, that music came on. A little advance warning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right th this is a really interesting question the first gaming box set you ever remember owning Ooh, box set um you know uh villains and vigilantes uh way oh, back when nice came, <clears throat> came in a box back then I have the box. I, I actually bought that box set. I bought it at a flea market used. Like <laughs> you know, Star Frontier is really close, but I'm pretty sure I got I'm pretty sure I got uh uh that one first. Yeah, so, that was the first I, one I ever bought with my own yeah. money too. My <laughs> friends and I all pooled our money to buy that game. <laughs> 
<clears throat> and then sent away from, for it, like from an ad in Dragon Magazine, because uh, we didn't have a game store. And then it took so long to get to us that I made up my own superhero game in the time that it took. <laughs> and we played that a couple of times before Villains of Vigilantes showed up. And I love Amazing. that you, you I, I make mention of that in the review I wrote because you put that in the forward, which was. Oh, awesome. that's right. You knew that already. Yeah, no, that was, <laughs> that was great that everybody else didn't know it. That's what I'm saying. So it's awesome. Just like, you know, the insight, like all the people, you guys out there, you don't realize how many superhero games Monty has actually worked on. And, and like <laughs> stuff that we didn't get to see because, you know, the game got canceled. But now we got Claim the Sky, so we get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so you survived the second round of rapid fire. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I think we actually stumped you once or twice in this one. Woo! Did. There were some really comes. hard ones in there. There were. Well, I personally just I love children of the dam, but every time I tell someone that's like under the age of 25, they never know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only reason they know the omen is because it was remade, you know. True. True. Yeah, creepy. Oh. Kids. There's nothing creepier than creepy kids. So yeah. tell me about it. You know, and say I can go real obscure and hit you in the head. You'd probably yeah. know this one, Amati. Remember the brood? I do. I remember uh, the brood. those those had me bothered by children in snowsuits for years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. All no, right, Brother guys. Luka, it's actually a great movie. You should look it up. Children of the Dam is a great, great movie. Yes, it is. And yeah. the brood. Yeah. So, so guys, you know, we're all done here for tonight, but um, just want to tell everybody thank you for coming out. Guys, you got any last final thoughts before we start wrapping stuff up? I mean, I, I'll go first before I go into my spiel. Um, please go out and support the Kickstarter. I mean, Everybody knows we, you know, we're Monty Cook Games fans. As you know, we're Cypher Unlimited. That's what I was about. But I can honestly say there's not a company that puts out a better product and a better bang for your buck. Just look at what you're getting. You're getting three complete games, you know, for about a hundred bucks. You can't beat that anywhere. You can't beat that with a stick. Let's <laughs> let's go out and support. Not only that, they but everything that they promise on the Kickstarters, they fulfill, you know. It's no secret that everyone knows the MCG when it comes to Kickstarter and it comes to fulfilling their product, they always do and go above and beyond. So if you're on the fence, don't be on the fence any longer. Jump off that fence and, you know, click that button and go go to Kickstarter and support it. You know, but other than that, you know, we love you guys. So uh, and we love you, Monty, and we love MCG. So that's all I have to say. Um, real quick before you start into your spiel though, uh, Monty, for people who want to see more from you, I already have a few links uh, in the chat here. Where else can people find you online? Like Twitter, Facebook, like what, what, where is the best place to see stuff from you? Uh, well, uh, MCG is on, is on Twitter. Um, MC, Monty could get, I'm sorry. Well, they're on Twitter too, uh, but also on Facebook, um, both. And uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Monty J. Cook. Uh, I've also started writing a, a series of articles about game design on Substack. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can, you know, you f can find the link to that really easily. It sounds like here, but also on my Twitter. So, uh, yeah, check it out. I just I just talk about like theories about game design and, and the thought processes that go into a, in designing a game. Yeah, it's really awesome. Final thought, yeah, and that would be my final thought to tell everybody, if you haven't started reading it, read it. If you are a burgeoning game designer, if you are a game master, if you are a writer, if you are a creative person in any sense of the word, this is so educational, so eye-opening. Um, I love it. It has helped me immensely in the things in my endeavors. And I'm here to tell you, you know, these guys just make you they embrace it, you know, and Monty is like, like, uh, I gotta hit you, your line again, Anthony, it's the best line in the world. We got to get his shirt made. Yeah. The illest <laughs> man game in the game. I mean, just, it's just ridiculous. It's awesome. So we do enjoy it. And, uh, you know, Anthony, take us on out of here. Tell these people what's going on. If you like us and you like what we do, please give us a follow here on Twitch. You will really appreciate it or, su or subscribe on Twitch. Don't have to if you don't got it, but if you do, we really appreciate it. It helps us out with little things like Zoom course. Go to our YouTube channel. Give us a like, share, and follow there. So please subscribe there. We're trying to get a view account up to 
a thousand members. We we'll really, really, really appreciate it. You know, all the, everything we do here goes up on YouTube the following day. Join the largest fan one Discord server for all things Monty Cook Games. We have over 4,000 members and growing. Please join our Cypher Unlimited Discord where there's games being run every day, people talking about all things Monty Cook Games. And it's just a wonderful community. It is. All, you know, we're all here and supportive. If you don't like Discord, join our Facebook group. It's not as big as our Discord, but we still do the same things there. We'll, and if you want to get in the game, we'll link you up and we'll, we'll find a group for you there. Go to the Cypher Unlimited um, store and get this cool Cypher Unlimited merch like me and Dean got on. You know, if you don't got it, once again, you don't have to, but we really appreciate it if you do. And last but not least, go to our coffee site. Give us a little donation there. Our videos will always be free, but it helps us out with little things like Zoom course. Last but not least, we love you guys. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again so much, everybody, for stopping by. Thank you again, Monty, for coming on talking about your new Kickstarter. It's definitely very exciting. If you haven't backed it, guys, go back it. About 48 hours left, 49 hours. Definitely don't want to miss the boat on three fantastic sounding games. Um, and yeah, uh, from us at the CU, we will see you later. Thanks, guys.